if you if, if you're if you're talking to a d digital super intelligence and can't tell if that is a computer or a human like let's say you're just having a conversation over a phone or a video conference or something where lo looks like a person makes all of the right uh uh, inflections and movements and, and all the small subtleties that constitute a uh, human uh, and uh, talks like a human makes mistakes like a human and, and you literally just can't tell is this are you video conferencing with a person or, a, or a, an AI might as well might as well be human so on a darker topic you've expressed serious concern about existential threats of AI it's perhaps one of the greatest challenges our civilization faces. But since I would say we're kind of an optimistic descendants of apes, perhaps we can find several paths of escaping the harm of AI. So if I can give you three options, maybe you can comment which do you think is the most promising. One is scaling up efforts on AI safety and beneficial AI research in, in hope of finding an algorithmic or maybe a policy solution. Two is becoming a multiplanetary species as quickly as possible. And three is merging with AI and, and riding the wave of that increasing intelligence uh, as it continuously improves. What do you think is most promising, most interesting as a civilization that we should invest in? I think there's, there's a, lot, a tremendous amount of investment going on in AI. Where there's a lack of investment is in AI safety and there should be, in my view, a government agency that oversees anything related to AI to confirm that it is does not represent a public safety risk. Just as there is a regulatory authority for, just like the Food and Drug Administration, there's NHTSA for autom automotive safety, there's the FAA for aircraft safety, where it generally comes to the conclusion that it is important to have a government referee or a referee that is serving the public interest in, in ensuring that things are safe when when there's a potential danger to the public. Um, I would argue that uh, AI is unequivocally uh, something that has potential to be dangerous to the public and therefore should have a regulatory agency just as other things that are dangerous to the public have a regulatory agency. But let me tell you the problem with this is that the government moves very slowly. Usually the way a regulatory agency comes into being is that something terrible happens. There's a huge public outcry. And years after that, there's a regulatory agency or a rule put in place. Take something like, like seat belts. It was known for, I don't know, a decade or more that seat belts would have a massive impact on uh, safety and, and save so many lives and serious injuries. And the car industry fought the requirement to put seat belts in tooth and nail. That's crazy. Yeah. And, and, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of people probably died because of that. And they said people wouldn't buy cars if they had seat belts, which is obviously absurd. You know, or look at the tobacco industry and how long they fought any thing about smoking. That's part of why I helped make that movie, Thank You for Smoking. You can sort of see just how pernicious it can be when you have these companies effectively achieve regulatory capture of, of government the bad. People in the AI community refer to the advent of digital superintelligence as a singularity. That That is not to say that it is good or bad, but it, that it is very difficult to predict uh, what will happen after that point. And and that there's some probability it will be bad, some probability it will be, it will be good. We obviously want to affect that probability and have it be more good than bad. Right now, just the, the data we have regarding how the brain works is, is very limited. You know, we've got fMRI, which is, that that's kind of like putting a, you know, a stethoscope on the outside of a factory wall and, and, and then putting it like all over the factory wall and you can sort of hear the sounds, but you don't know what the machines are doing, really. You know, you, it's hard. You, you can infer a few things, but it's a very broad brushstroke. In order to really know what's going on in the brain, you really need, you have to have high precision sensors, and then you want to have stimulus and response. Like if, if you trigger a neuron, what, how, how do you feel? What do you see? How does it change your perception of the world? I should think the machine side is far more malleable than the biological side by, by a huge amount. So it will be the 
the machine that adapts to the brain. It ha that's the only thing that's possible. The brain can't adapt that well to, to, to the machine. You can't have neurons start to regard an electrode as an, like another neuron because like neurons just there's like the pulse, and so something else is pulsing. See, so, so there's there is that there is that that elasticity in the interface, which we believe is, is something that can can happen. But the vast majority of the malleability will have to be on the machine side. There will be some adjustment to the brain because there's, there's going to be something reading and simulating the the brain, and so it will adjust to to that thing. But but most the vast majority of the adjustment will be on the machine side. This is just it, this is just it has to be that otherwise it will not work. Ultimately, like we, you know, we currently operate on two layers. We have sort of a limbic, like prime primitive brain layer which is where all of our kind of impulses are coming from. It's sort of like we've got, we've got like a monkey brain with a computer stuck on it. That's, that's the human brain. <laughs> and a lot of our impulses and everything are driven by the monkey brain. And the, the computer, the cortex, uh, is constantly trying to make the mon monkey brain happy. It's not the cortex that's steering the monkey brain, it's the monkey brain steering the cortex. The cortex is like what we call like human intelligence. You know, so it's like the, that's like the advanced computer relative to other creatures. Uh, other, other creatures do not have either really they, they, don't, they don't have the computer or they have a very weak computer relative to humans it, it sort of seems like sh surely the really smart thing should control the dumb thing but actually the dumb thing controls the smart thing I mean we're a neural net and, and that you know AI is basically a neural net so it's like digital neural net will interface with biological neural net and hopefully bring us along for the ride, you know. But the vast majority of our, of, of our, of our intelligence will be digital. So like think of like the, the difference in intelligence between your, your cortex and your limbic system is gigantic. Your, your, your limbic system really has no comprehension of what the hell the cortex is doing. Um, you know, it's just literally hungry, you know, or tired or angry or or something, you know, and, and then it, that communicates that that impulse to the cortex and tells the cortex to go satisfy that. People generally don't uh, lose the cortex either, right? So they like having the cortex and the limbic system. Yeah. Uh, and and then there's a tertiary layer which will be digital superintelligence. And I think there's room for optimism given that the cortex, the, 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 the cortex is very intelligent and the limbic system is not, and yet they work together well. Perhaps there can be a tertiary layer uh, where, where digital superintelligence lies, and that that will be vastly more intelligent than the cortex, but still coexist peacefully and in a, in a benign manner with the cortex and limbic system. Humanity really is not evolved to think of existential threats in general. We're evolved to think about things that are very close to us, near term, to, to be upset with other humans, and, and not, not to really to think about things that could destroy humanity as a whole. Um, but then in recent decades, recent, just really in the last century, we had nu nuclear bombs, which are, could potentially destroy civilization, obviously. Uh, we have AI, which could destroy civilization. Uh, we have global warming, which could destroy civilization, or, or at least severely disrupt uh, civilization. You could make a swarm of assassin drones for very little money by just taking the, the, the face ID chip that's used in cell phones and uh, having a small explosive charge and a, and a standard drone and have them just do a grid sweep of the building until they find the person they're looking for, ram into them and, ex and explode. You can do that right now. No extra, no new technologies needed. Right now. This, this is what the future will be. Okay. Is autonomous drone warfare. Um, I can't believe I'm saying this. This is, this is like dangerous, but it's simply what will occur is, is, is sort of a is drones locally being autonomous um, and but I think we still want to retain authority to d damage or destroy you know anything that that isn't an autonomous drone the danger is going to be more humans using it against each other I think most likely you know it would be something in the same way that humans destroyed the habitat of primates when homo sapiens became much smarter than other primates. I pushed all the other ones into small habitats. They're just in the way. Ensuring that the advent of AI is 
good, or at least we tried to make it good. Seems like a smart move. But we're way behind on that. Yes, we're not paying attention. Do we worry more about what, what name somebody called someone else than whether AI will destroy humanity? That's insane. I, I don't think most people understand just how quickly machine intelligence is advancing. It's much faster than almost anyone realizes, even within Silicon Valley. And certainly outside Silicon Valley, people really have no idea. If, if, there's, if there's a super intelligent, particularly if it's engaged in recursive self-improvement, if there's some digital super, super intelligence um, and its optimization or utility function um, is something that's detrimental to humanity, then it will have a very bad effect. Uh, you know, it could be just something like getting rid of spam email or something. And it's like concludes, well, the best way to get rid of spam is to get rid of humans. We, we have five years. I think digital superintelligence will happen in my lifetime. If AI has a goal and humanity just happens to be in the way, it will destroy humanity as a matter of course without even thinking about it. No hard feelings. Well, assuming civilization is still around, it's looking fragile right now. I think we, I think we could have a, in 25 years, probably something, I think there could be a whole brain interface. Like almost all the neurons are connected to your, the, the sort of AI extension of yourself. It would just be that, that more of you would be in the cloud than in your body. I mean, this certainly has taken over the mind space of the world to a degree that is quite shocking. But what to do about mass unemployment? This is going to be a massive social challenge. Um, and I think ultimately we will have to have some kind of universal basic income. I don't think we're going to have a choice. There will be fewer and fewer jobs that a robot cannot do better. These are not uh, things that I think that I wish would happen. These are think, simply things that I think probably will happen. If my assessment is correct and they probably will happen, then we need to say what are we going to do about it. And I think some kind of a universal basic income is going to be necessary. The, the, the harder challenge, much harder challenge, is how do people then have meaning? Like a lot of people, they derive their meaning from their employment. If, if you're not needed, if there's not a need for your labor, what's the meaning? Do you, do you have meaning? Do you feel useless? These are much, that's a much harder problem to deal with. And then how do we ensure that the future is going to be the future that we want, that we still like? To, to some degree, we are already a cyborg. Like the fact that, as I was mentioning earlier, you can ask a question and instantly get an answer uh, from Google or you know, from other things. I think we're missing a few key ideas for general, artificial general intelligence. But it's going to be upon us very quickly. And then we'll need to figure out what shall we do if we even have that choice. It's amazing how people can't differentiate between, say, the narrow AI that, you know, allows a car to figure out what a lane line is and navigate streets versus general intelligence. Like these are just very different things. Like your toaster and, a, and your computer are both machines, but one's much more sophisticated than another. I, to, to me, right now, this seems game, set, match. If you assume any rate of advancement in AI, um, we will be left behind by a lot. Even the benign situation, if you have some you know, if you have ultra-intelligent AI, um, we would be so so far below them in intelligence that it would be would be like, you know, a pet. I think AI will be capable of convincing you to fall in love with it very well. You know, we start getting into a metaphysical question of like, do emotions and thoughts exist in a different realm than the physical? From a physics standpoint, essentially, if if it loves you in a way that is that you can't tell whether it's real or not, it is real. So when maybe you or somebody else creates an AGI system and you get to ask her one question, what would that question be? What's outside the simulation?